morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we are meeting together this morning to consider an amendment to S348, which is on today's House calendar for action. Um, we are going to go first to the primary sponsor of the amendment. And so, Linda Myers, go ahead and, uh, and explain to us what you're uh, trying to get at here in your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. I appreciate the opportunity to present this amendment. Um, first of all, I want to tell everybody, and I will be uh, telling everybody else, I'm in favor of voting by mail. So we can start off with that. However, when it came to this particular bill, I had some, some reservations. So basically what I'm asking is to stripe out subsection C in its entirety, and instead um, have a new subsection, subsection that reads that the Secretary of State, if the Secretary of State orders or permits mailings, that those ballots shall be returned in the manner prescribed in 17 VSA 2543, which is the early voter absentee ballots, return of ballots, but may be returned only by the voter, the justices of the peace who delivered the ballot and or authorized family member, <clears throat> excuse me, or caregiver acting on the voter's behalf. Then the, the amendment goes on to say if, if, if this section C is, uh, um, takes place and someone, uh, uh, in, uh, I, guess, I guess the word is against the rule of law, uh, brings up uh, absentee ballots that they shouldn't, that there is a fine uh, and the attorney general can uh, um, tell the, say that, um, that uh, we'll conduct a civil uh, investigation. And then I've added what family members actually mean and what a caregiver means. And that's the amendment. Great, thank you. Thank um, you. So I think it would be helpful to go to Chris Winters at this point. And Chris, I'll, I'll give you the freedom to bounce back and forth between you and Will and uh, Jim, if uh, if Jim would like to testify as well. So thank you. Great, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And, and, and we always appreciate the opportunity to testify. I can be very brief. And as you said, uh, Will Senning is also here and he'd be happy to answer questions kind of about the mechanics of the bill and, and how it works. Um, but I would uh, say here on behalf of the Secretary of State's office, as we previously stated in this committee and in the Senate, we strongly prefer a clean bill and a concurrence with the Senate language. So we would object or oppose to this amend, uh, oppose this amendment for, for a number of reasons. Uh, the first of which is that this amendment is attempting to address a problem that, that barely exists. Yeah, the reason provider is used is because they're, um, they're licensed to saying Ann Donahue is double zooming because that sounds like Mari. <laughs> Thank uh -huh. you, Ann, for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd say the amendment is attempting to address a problem that barely exists. And to the extent that it does exist, it's already illegal. It's illegal to impersonate a voter. It's illegal to vote someone else's ballot, to influence a voter, or to discard somebody's ballot. These things are already illegal under current law and prosecutable. We recommend concurring with the Senate language to allow us to get to work with a clear path forward as soon as possible. We've, we've spoken time and time again about how time is of the essence. We need a decision quickly and we need to get on a clear path to a safe election and an election that is uh, uh, safe and secure in November. We would urge you to leave the return of ballot language to the Secretary of State's office uh, we're going to address return of ballots in a directive after really careful consideration with the clerks and with other stakeholders. We need to be thoughtful to ensure that any measures that we take around this, around the return of ballots, takes into account both election integrity and the inadvertent unintended consequence of uh, disenfranchising voters if it's too narrowly drawn. And we believe this amendment is too narrowly drawn. 
I am uh, glad to see Carol Dawes on the call, and I hope she gets a chance to speak to you about the many ways in which voters currently, under our current law, under our current system, get their absentee ballots back to the town clerk. And limiting it to the language that you have in this amendment uh, is uh, constricting it, we think, probably a, a little bit too far. So regardless of how someone votes their ballot, whether it's by mail or in person, it's already under, against the law to impersonate or unduly influence a voter. Changing how a voter gets their ballot returned to the clerk in no way changes the fact that that's illegal. So to argue that this language is necessary is, um, is not really true in our view. Uh, the vote, uh, the, the focus of, and the concern of this bill and of our election system ought to remain on allowing eligible voters being able to vote safely should there be a health crisis in the fall. And by all indications, we're going to have this virus come rearing back, it's roaring back at some point. Uh, we ought to be thinking about including ways to accessibly receive vote and return ballots and to have votes counted. So um, we, we oppose this amendment. We don't think it's necessary. We will be addressing return of ballots in a Secretary of State directive. Uh, and before I wrap up, I'll just add that if you watched any coverage of the primary election in Georgia yesterday, or if you watched uh, coverage of some of the primaries a week ago uh, Tuesday, it's like we're watching a car wreck in slow motion. Vermont is quite obviously not Georgia, but we can certainly learn from those other states. We can learn from Georgia and we'd be foolish not to take those lessons to heart. Voters had to wait in line for several hours in some counties yesterday with some voters actually abandoning their spots in line because they had to wait too long. Some of the big problems that we saw there were the result of a, of, a, of a lack of poll workers, poll workers who decided they were not going to show up in a pandemic, lack of trained poll workers, which is why we want a clear directive soon and a path so that we can educate and train. And we also saw, um, you know, this is just anecdotal, but it appears that there was a last minute surge of voters in areas like Atlanta in response to current events um, who didn't request or receive their absentee ballots in time. So they were forced to come out in person and forced to stand in really long lines. Um, we don't wanna see that happen in Vermont in November. There are obvious differences between uh, some of these other states and Vermont, but we think the best solution here is to ensure that every registered active voter gets a ballot in November, just in case, so we can be prepared to avoid anything that comes our way any of the unexpected that we could see in November. Uh, appreciate the time, thank you. Happy to answer any questions. And again, Will Senning is also on the line to uh, answer your questions about the mechanics of this election season. Thank you, Chris. Rob LeClaire has a question. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I, I don't know if it's a question for Chris or Will, but <clears throat> good morning, gentlemen. Um, one, can you give me Explain to me how anything about this amendment would, would slow down the process as it currently um, is envisioned as far as mailing out the ballots in November. Um, from my take on it, there's nothing about this that would uh, belay the getting the ballots and the envelopes and, and the process in general. And then secondly, Chris, you've referred to that you're going to be sending out a directive around the returning of ballots after um, would you share with us what that's going to look like? Yeah, it's it's to be determined, Representative LeClaire. It's a, a good question. There are a lot of other states that um, put some kinds of guardrails. We have some language already in current law. Like I said, we want to talk to town clerks. We want to talk to uh, lots of other stakeholders who represent voters about how narrowly we want to prescribe that to make sure that we get it right so that we protect both uh, election integrity and protect people's right to vote to make sure that they can get their ballots back. This will be a prepaid postage mailing. So we don't see this as being a, a, a big issue that most voters will be able to very easily put ballots in the mail. But um, as I think you'll hear from other testimony today, there are instances where people can't even get to their mailbox, right? So they need to have alternative methods to get their ballot back. 
as long as that ballot is in the secrecy envelope, it's signed, it's sealed, um, how it gets back to the town clerk is uh, of less concern to us than some of the other issues that we're facing for the fall. Now that said, we're gonna address this in a directive, but that language has yet to be determined. And we do have a lot of other states to look at, but we want a solution that's right for Vermont. Now, as to um, slowing down the process at all, uh, if we have further amendment on this bill, it's gonna take longer in the legislature, it's going to have to go back to the Senate. We needed a decision on this um, over a month ago. We really were hoping to have a decision and hoping to be able to start our initiative and move forward with a clear path. Uh, further amendment is, uh, uh, in our view, really just gonna, gonna slow things down further and, and we'd love to avoid that. Well, actually, I mean, this is only about just taking the governor out of it as far as agreement. There's nothing else about this is there that prevents you from going ahead and doing what you need to do to get prepared? We are doing a lot already, uh, Representative Leclerc, and, and some of it I think you're, you're aware of as far as um, ordering paper, ordering ballots, getting things printed, getting things ready. Uh, but as we've said all along, it's really unfair to our elections team, to the vendors that we're working with, uh, to ask us to enter into contracts, uh, purchase things, spend money. Um, there are a lot of things that we're, we're doing that we're doing on shaky ground because we're not sure if the rug's going to be pulled out from under us in, in November uh, or actually in August or even before then. Um, so what we're looking for is some certainty and uh, any further amendment here is um, we think going to kind of inter interfere with that. Very good. Thank you. Al Colston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a question for Will Senek. Um, can you give us an idea of how many cases of voter fraud have been discovered and prosecuted? To my knowledge, very few, Representative Colston, in my entire time, my eight years in the office, nine years in the office, and six or seven now as director, um, none that have been prosecuted. Thank you. Uh, Marsha Gardner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is, how would the town clerk confirm that the person returning the ballot is indeed a family member or a caregiver? How do you envision that process working, especially with um, the COVID crisis? I think that's a question that's better for either for Will or yeah. for um, perhaps Carol Dawes. Um, or perhaps uh, Representative Myers. Rep Gardner, I, I would envision um, that being a self-identification, you know, a, a statement from that person that that is the fact. You certainly would not want to um, burden the clerks with having to do any kind of investigation into whether that's true or not. Right. Asking for an identification. Thank you. Um, much like I would liken it to, there's the process now where an authorized person can request um, an absentee ballot on behalf of a voter. And in that case, they, they just um, submit the form saying as much and signing to that fact themselves that they have been authorized. Okay. Thank you. Linda? That's pretty much what I think. The only thing is, is that uh, in an instance that what I'm looking at is an instance of uh, say a senior development, not a nursing home, but something like a senior development who someone might go in uh, and offer to help people sign their ballots. And I have a really concern about that. I think if it's, as I said, if it's a family member, if it's a caregiver, and there's a whole list of family and who, who constitutes family members down to uh, grandparents in law, et cetera. But I just have a concern about groups of people who live together, again, not those in nursing homes, but we have here in Essex, we have several senior uh, living facilities. Uh, they are apartments, they are condos. Uh, and I have a concern that someone may go around and say, oh, hey, you know, here I am. We're not necessarily 
saying what what they do or who they are, but I'd be more than willing to help you mark your ballot and take it down to the town offices. So that's the concern that I have. All right, um, Jim Harrison. Thank you. Um, I guess this is for um, Deputy Secretary uh, Winters, but um, I know um, you were asked about the delay and uh, what I thought what we heard last week was the secretary's office was already proceeding as if we're going to do mail-in ballots. We're making arrangements. Um, obviously you can't print the ballots yet, um, but we're doing, you were doing everything else. Is that true? That, that's true, Representative Harrison. And one thing that I neglected to mention on my previous answer was that one thing we haven't been able to do is to give clear direction to the clerks and the poll workers about what we're doing because we're not sure what we're doing yet. We're not positive. We're making every preparation for the worst case scenario, uh, but we have not pulled the trigger on any of that. And the education and outreach piece and the training piece is, is a really important aspect that we've had to hold off on. I understand. So your position then is just concur with the Senate, whether they made a technical mistake in the bill or not, just concur because you want the bill um, as opposed to waiting till Friday when they can concur or tomorrow when they can concur with the House proposal amendment. I, I guess I'm, I guess we've decided we're comfortable with the bill as amended by the Senate. Um, it wasn't our preference, but the fact that it came across the way that it did, we're, we're comfortable with that language. This further amendment, we think, muddies the, the water on return of ballots in a way that may make it difficult for us uh, to clarify in a directive. Um, we'd rather do it in a directive after further consideration. Um, you know, I, I, I can appreciate that, except that the language is from what I can see is pretty similar to what a lot of other states currently do. And in fact, um, some states like neighboring Massachusetts um, limit it even further, only immediate family. Um, um, you know, uh, some states say specifically a candidate cannot collect um, or a candidate's family cannot collect ballots. Uh, uh, this doesn't narrow it to that. Um, so, you know, I guess, you know, I don't, I, I think, I don't know that it's an issue of fraud. I think we're, we're going forth uh, apparently in a totally new uh, way of sending out ballots and that uh, we should put some bumper guards up on the return as opposed to waiting to see if there's a problem. And then after the fact say, oh, yeah, I guess we should have done something differently. We're trying to help provide some guidance there. Um, and I, I just don't, I, I'm missing something because I, right now under current law, and I think you would probably agree, anybody can collect and return ballots. Candidates, interest groups, whatever. I think that's correct under current law, Representative Harrison, the, the language, and maybe Will Senning would wanna to speak to that a little bit more clearly than, than I can. Um, but I, I, I guess in response to that, I would um, point out that we've had vote by mail, we've had absentee ballots uh, for many years, many, many elections, hundreds if not Mil hundreds of thousands, if not even you know millions of votes by mail. And this issue has not been an issue. Um, so uh, we, we really don't see the need for this amendment. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand what you're saying. It's different though, when you mail a ballot to people who don't request them. Um, a lot of the requested early ballots, uh, and I know I've done it, I fill it out right at the town clerk's office when I go in to request it. Um, there's no opportunity for someone else to collect that or harvest that ballot. Um, and many of the mail ballots 
for early absentee are turned around because the people are going to be away on election day and they want to get it done and they requested it so they know they're voting. So it's different. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Sure. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, I, I just had a question for Representative Myers. Um, what, what problem are you trying to solve by this amendment? I mean, you started to talk about it, but I, I just want to really understand what problem you're trying to solve here. I just have a, a problem with the idea that there's a, a pos possibility that someone could go to, as I said, a group, ho group home where seniors live who, who have a tendency not to want to go to the polls. Actually, a lot of seniors do want to go to the polls, but uh, who feel that they can't go it to the polls, especially in the case of uh, uh, November when the weather can be kind of chancy. And I am concerned that there may be a, an individual or a group of individuals who would take it upon themselves to go to these homes, homes these developments and say, hey, I'm coming here, I'm gonna go vote. I'd be more than willing to take your ballot. And then I just don't know that those ballots to me, those ballots would specifically make it, which is why I'm talking about family members into a, into a large amount of family members. So your concern is if that somebody picked up a number of ballots at an assisted living facility that they would not provide them to the to the town clerk? Well, that's a possibility. That's uh, that's fraud. But you know, I understand, and the, and and my amendment, you know, gives a. A, a, a legal uh, definition and asks for the attorney general's office or the secretary of state's office to, uh, uh, if this is found out, to find these people who may do this. And are you aware of instances of that happening in Vermont in past elections? I am not aware. I am aware that it has happened somewhere across the United States, specifically in Vermont. I'm a justice of the peace in the town of Essex. I deal with elections all the time, but I just, this is a, something totally different. This is something that someone's going to get in their home that they never asked for. And maybe we'll say, well, gee, I don't necessarily know that I really want to do this, but oh, I understand someone's willing to pick my, this up for me and I'll give it to them. And I just have a concern about that. It's, it boils down to that one finite issue for me. Okay, so there's no instances of this happening in Vermont. What other instances are there across this country? I don't know specifically. Uh, I've done some reading, but I haven't. I can't bear down and say exactly what states have done this. But it's just I have this concern. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Bob Hooper. Uh, John just. Uh did an excellent job of asking the uh, line of questioning that I was going to. To my, I'm glad to see you back, Linda, uh, from the neighborhood of uh, seat 99 and 100. Um, I, I don't see this as much of a change at all. Uh, I was on the phone as I was signing on to this Zoom call with a friend from Pennsylvania who just went through their primary and said it was uh, something that I would not repeat on YouTube. Um, and quite frankly, Linda, your example of having a family member do this, my brother-in-law is the last person in the world that I would want me to want to help fill out my ballot. So there's, there's flaws there too. But my, my general question was the same as John's. Uh, aside from an election being overturned because of ballot manipulation in Georgia or South Carolina, I, I don't think this has ever been much of a problem either. So when I read your amendment, uh, my note to question you was, uh, you have a concern. What's the basis of your concern? Because I'd really like to hear it. And and I, I, your concern is valid, but I don't think there's any evidence of Vermonters ever going down this path. And, uh, you know, notwithstanding the points that were made by a couple of our committee members, um, we have heard for over a month that this is an important thing to get moving. And I agree. Let's move it on. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't All think right, I have I don't think I have to answer. He's pretty much 
given given me his thoughts on it and I've responded to John previously. Yeah. And thank you for doing so. Thank you. I've got a couple other committee members and then I want to give Ann Donahue uh, as a co-sponsor of the bill a moment to speak. So um, Bob Hooper is going to put his hands down and uh, Rob LeClaire. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I think we're, we're kind of confusing the issue here. I don't think that there's much disagreement that there hasn't been any document cases of voter fraud but I don't think you have to look too far and wide to look. There's been a lot of election fraud, a lot of election manipulation. And it's not any one party. It, we're, they're all guilty of it. But I believe that this is the main concern here and what this amendment would address. It's not the voter fraud, it's election fraud. And that's what we're certainly trying to make sure doesn't happen out there. Um, and my other question just totally evaporated. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, put your hand back up when you think of your question again. Uh, Ann Donahue. Okay, I'm trying to unmute. I've never used the iPad before, but I've got my other thing going for my committee. Ah, the um, double I, zoom. I just, yeah first time trying this. So I, I want to say, I, I really support getting this out to people. I support moving on it. I have some reservations, but not enough to not support it. I'm not worried about fraud. I'm worried much more about um, unintended um, pressure on folks. And it specifically has to do with the very big difference that everybody will have a ballot uh, regardless of whether they would have intended to vote. And here's a, a, a scenario that I so easily picture um, because it is similar to what happens now, but it's an added step. So you got a pastor of a congregation who has always exhorted his or her parishioners to vote, to follow their civic duty. And by the way, please vote for the most moral candidates or whatever the phrasing is. Um, and parishioners hear that and make their own decision. You know, that pastor now knows they've all got a ballot at their home and in the best of intentions, wants to encourage they use it and, and goes out to them, to their houses and say, have you voted yet? Because I can pick it up for you right now and bring it just so that we make sure you don't forget. And that person is going to feel pressured about needing to go ahead and vote because my pastor wants me to and is right at my door. And oh, that's right. And wanted me to vote in a certain way. That's what I'm afraid of if you've got, if, if people are allowed to go around to groups of people that they want to specifically make sure they don't forget and encourage to vote um, and maybe even to vote a certain way. So, so that's what's in my mind on this. Um, one example of any number of um, folks who really uh, well-intentioned want to promote um, a good thing and the way they would like to see votes come in. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe a simple limit. You can't, one person, I, I know a lot of states say you, you can't, you can't bring in more than 10 uh, ballots for other people or something like that. But, but this is the core in terms of what problem you're trying to get at. I think, I think we know the existence of um, groups of people who are encouraged to vote a certain way. So we know that exists. It can't be overbearing currently because you're not going to people at their home, but with all the ballots going out to people who didn't ask for them, it does, I think, create a much expanded opportunity for that encouragement to um, go beyond the line of what we'd want to see it go. And, the, and that's my concern and what um, I was attempting to address uh, with this amendment. Thank you. Um, Chris or Will, any response to that relative to Looks current like law broke. and current practice or uh, relative to the directive that you expect to send out? Sure, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, 
I'm struggling a little bit with what the, 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 the problem is in, you know, here in some ways this is describing people encouraging other people to vote, which is a good thing, but I guess it's when it, when it crosses that line and telling them how to vote, the, the undue influence piece of this uh, is illegal or taking their ballots and filling them out is illegal. I, you know, I think this is addressed under current law. I understand the, the concern, but don't see it as that much different than the existing system that we have where, for example, a bunch of uh, sailors on, the, on a ship in the middle of the Pacific Ocean are voting by mail and their commanding officer is telling them they ought to exercise their right to vote and perhaps even opining about how they should vote. That happens all the time as well with a pastor encouraging their congregation. But it's the, it's the individual sacrosanct private right to vote that we're trying to encourage and protect here and voting by mail is one way to do that in the middle of a, of a pandemic. Um, so I, I, I guess I don't see this uh, language as addressing uh, the problem that's, that's being described or perhaps addressing it in too restrictive of a way that has unintended consequences on people being able to get their ballots back in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so committee, we've got a couple more people we need to hear from and uh, and I do want to make sure that we get through all of the different perspectives on this. Um, so I'm going to go to Ellis Botswood next. Um, the, the amendment that is being proposed here does contain um, a violation and fine um, provision that and I'm just curious to hear the Perspective of the secretary or the AG's office with respect to voter fraud um, allegations and prosecution. Certainly. Um, so, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll keep it relatively brief. Um, I'm really just echoing a lot of what the Secretary of State has said. Um, we really only just got to see this amendment this morning. I know the Secretary of State's office has been working on this bill a lot longer. And frankly, um, has more to say about how it will operate. Uh, in terms of the fine specifically, um, I would echo that uh, we have a number of provisions already that penalize um, the sorts of things that we've been talking about this morning, uh, including undue influence uh, to dictate control or alter the vote of a voter, um, as well as you know tampering with ballots uh, or otherwise um, interfering with ballots being counted, um, which seems to me to be at the heart of the amendment. I could be wrong about that. Um, and I would echo again that we do have a robust history of absentee voting in Vermont. Um, and from the enforcement perspective, uh, I know Will Sanning touched on this a little bit, but uh, we really haven't seen a need for further penalties here uh, beyond what we already have which again, I think is pretty duplicative um, of what's being proposed. Um, so obviously, ultimately, it's sort of a policy decision, which is uh, the jurisdiction of the committee and will enforce whatever we've got. But um, uh, I think the, the laws that we already have on the books, uh, which penalize undue influence over voting uh, and interference with ballots being counted uh, have been certainly sufficient in the past and from our point of view are, are still sufficient. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Ella. JP. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question I have is concerning the laws on the books. Um, and specifically, are they criminal or a civil, in other words, criminal offense or civil offense deal and criminal may be dealing with jail time and civil would be strictly fines. Can you just tell me what they what they are currently? Certainly, uh, those are uh, civil fines, um, similar, I think, to the proposed amendment, which is also civil fines. Okay, so there is no criminal offense of of voter fraud. Uh, there are some criminal provisions, which I think get to slightly different offenses, um, including making uh, giving perjury to uh, the board in terms of whether or not someone is authorized to be on the checklist, for instance, um, that contains a criminal penalty. Um, 
anything that uh, really anything under the penalties of perjury would um, contain criminal be subject to criminal penalties. Um, but specifically perjury before the board making the checklist um, is subject to imprisonment of not more than 15 years. Um, I think that's the main criminal one um, for voter related fraud type of provisions. Um, again, we have not had to enforce these really at all. Um, so for the most part, they're civil fines um, and we do have some uh, criminal provisions if we need them. Okay, and I believe you, you commented that the, the um, current civil fines are consistent with those fines listed in the proposed amendment, is that correct? Uh, they're not the same, um, so most uh, most of the election related sort of fraudulent activity uh, type provisions are sub subject to fines of up to $200. Um, so the certainly the provision in the amendment of uh, not more than a $1,000 fine is, is slightly steeper than what we have. Um, for the most part, they are all uh, up to $200 with the exception of uh, that criminal uh, perjury provision that I discussed. Okay, so it's pretty pretty cheap to commit a, to commit a civil offense of uh, what we're considering voter fraud with harvest balloting, or excuse me, ballot harvesting and, and things of that nature. But so the fines in the proposed amendment are a little stiffer, might give a little bit more deterrent, but okay. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Certainly. All right, I don't see any other committee hands up at the moment. So I'm going to go next to Carol Dawes. So Carol, as a, uh, as a town clerk and a on, on the ground um, local elections administrator, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the issues around return of ballots. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I, here in Barrie, as an example, I have, people who come to the polls and bring with them a dozen ballots that they have collected from neighbors. It's a neighborhood thing. Um, it's a way she helps her neighbors. She goes around and collects ballots for them. Um, we expect to see her come in with those ballots. Her neighbors expect that. Uh, it's part of their relationship as neighbors. Um, one of my big concerns is, is how that would affect those voters uh, going forward. How would they be, how would we educate them that no, they can no longer do that. They can no longer give their ballot to this neighbor that they have to find a different way, either through the mail or, or whatever. Um, and so that's one of the things that concerns me. Um, under the current law, anybody can return a ballot for them, and anybody can assist a voter who, in filling out their ballot. We have people come to the polls, again, with a friend or neighbor uh, and ask that that friend or neighbor go into the ballot booth with them and help them fill out their ballot. That's their right. And I'm concerned that we're looking at it, that we need to look at it from the side of the voter and that um, putting these kinds of restrictions on might have uh, unintended voter suppression uh, outcomes associated with it. Uh, I think that, um, that we need to make sure that, that the voters still have uh, those rights to um, have the assistance that they want and to uh, use whatever methods uh, as it actually says in statute, to by whatever method get the ballot uh, back to the clerk's office. Um, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your uh, your your laying it out uh, as a balance point to make sure that we're not inadvertently disadvantaging um, voters who may need help. When when you see a voter ask uh, for someone to help them fill out their ballot is that is that 
because of a language barrier, because of uh, an inability to, to read um, or uh, poor eyesight? What, what are some of the situations in which you might see a voter come and ask to have someone join them in the, in the um, voting booth? Um, certainly there are times when we can, we can make an assumption based on seeing the, the, the person. It may be apparent that they, that they need assistance, physical assistance or assistance in, in reading a ballot. We certainly don't ask what the reasoning is. It's, it's the voter's right. Um, so there are instances where, where we don't know exactly what the relationship is. Um, but it's the voter that is making the choice. Um, it, you know, we, we would be a little circumspect if somebody came in and said, I'm dragging this person into the voting booth and helping them vote, but we don't see that. We see it's the voter's choice and we would certainly want to maintain that. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members for Carol? All right, I don't see anybody diving for their little blue hand. Um, uh, Ella. Um, sorry, I just wanted to correct one thing um, that I said in my testimony uh, in terms of the fines that are already on the books. Um, didn't want to leave that misrepresentation hanging. Um, there is a class of offenses uh, that are punishable by fines of up to $1,000. Uh, and that is for voters who knowingly vote uh, twice in the same election uh, on the same day, or someone who actually goes into the um, place and uh, attempts to uh, change the way that somebody's voting. Um, so that is punishable by um, up to $1,000. That's the more serious uh, level of fine that we have. Thank you for that clarification. Hal Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just, just want to make a comment. Um, I recall from a previous debate on another bill um, from one of the esteemed members of our committee who um, made the comment that we're looking for a solution for a problem that we don't have. So I really share that sentiment with regards to this amendment. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Um, any other perspectives that you would like to hear from, uh, from these witnesses? All right, so I would welcome um, a committee member to make a motion with regard to this, um, uh, this proposed amendment um, and Mike Merwicki with the quick draw on the little blue hand. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I move that we find this amendment unfavorable. Thank you. So, um, Marsha is probably filling out the, the committee roll call sheet as we speak. Um, an amendment to H348. And when you're ready, Marsha, you can go ahead and call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am ready to start. Um, Representative Gannon. Yes. And Warren is absent. Representative Merwicki. Yes. Clarification. Madam yes. Chair. Would, yes. Clarifying that Mike's motion was uh, that we find this unfavorable. So yes means no. Was that what okay. you were asking? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> gotcha. I get confused. <laughs> Representative LeClaire. Yes means no. No means yes. Rob, are you muted still? I didn't hear you answer. Uh, He's muted. No, ma'am. So your vote is no? Thank you. Yes. Representative Harrison? No. Gardner, yes. Representative Plasek? No. Representative Hooper? Yes. Representative Brownell? Yes. 
Representative Colston. Yes. Representative Copeland Hansis. Yes. So the vote is seven yes, three no, and one absent. All right, thank you all for um, being with us this morning. I believe we are on the floor at two. So um, hopefully you'll have a chance to get some fresh air and maybe not be on constant Zoom calls between now and two o'clock. Uh, Madam get... Chair, may yes. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I appreciate it. Thank you for being with us this morning, Linda. And I don't know if um, Ann Donahue may have already gone back to yeah. healthcare committee, but um, thank her as well. And uh, thank you to the other folks who were able to join us this morning, um, mm -hmm. particularly Ella for jumping right in on this <laughs> after getting an email about it <laughs> first thing this morning. So thank you for your quick turnaround on that. And I'll see many of you on the floor Zoom this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.